At the end of my handout for this lecture, there are several books you can read on, on the Sung Dynasty history and culture, which I uh, recommend, highly recommend. It is one by Peter Ball uh, called This Culture of Ours. I don't have my copy of that here. More recent and full of information is a book by Dieter Kuhn, The Age of Contemporary, The Age of Confucian Rule, rather, The Sung Transformation of China. This is in a series on Chinese history that is um, edited by my friend Tim Brook. My discussions of Neo-Confucianism, which are going to run through the recent lectures, that cosmological system that I think underlies the great development of landscape painting in Song Dynasty China, um, is based largely on a book by Joseph Needham. I don't have it here, it's in my library in Berkeley, but uh, <clears throat> it's the second volume in his series, Science and Technology in China, and his title, separate title, is History of Scientific Thought and Correlative Thinking. Now this was published in 1956, but actually I heard much of the argument in lectures that he gave at Berkeley uh, in 1949, outlining his ideas. He was brought there by the great Peter Budberg, the head of the Oriental Languages Department, in which I was a major. And I was deeply impressed by this. Uh, this is one of the really remarkable moments influential moments in my intellectual development. <clears throat> the idea of the universe that works through uh, correlation, not causation as in the Western Copernican system, uh, and making up a vast organism. Uh, this was, this, as I say, is an, uh, uh, an idea that affected me deeply. Needham, Needham, Joseph Needham, was struck by the resemblance, the relationship between this idea, this ancient Chinese idea, and um, recent Western scientific thinking. And he even had a theory by which the former had influenced the latter, that is to say, Chinese ideas as transmitted in the 17th century by the Jesuits to Europe uh, in letters to Leibniz particularly, uh, uh, whose theory of mind uh, influenced and introduced this kind of thinking to Europe, and then carrying it down to Whitehead and other scientific thinkers today. Um, and their philosophy of organism. Well, anyway, how this idea has fared since then, I have no idea whether it's still accepted, whether anybody believes what he said, but it sure influenced me a lot and impressed me very much and convinced me and changed my basic way of thinking. Before we proceed into the later Northern Sung period, the time of the Emperor Hui Zong, I want to backtrack a bit and review what I was saying about the great transformation that landscape painting as we observed it in the previous lecture, is uh, going through now, and about the philosophical implications of this. It may be somewhat repetitive, but I'd rather repeat and talk at length than fail to elucidate something that I think is really uh, basically important. Uh, before I do that, however, I want to do one of my brief so so sidetracks to make a point that seems important to me and not irrelevant to the later materials of this lecture. Now, here we have uh, two images. On the left, a painting by, it's actually an early, uh, no, excuse me, a 17th century master named Hung Ran, a uh, one of the great individualist masters of that period, who becomes a Buddhist monk on the fall of the Ming and so forth, and becomes a great master. Anyway, Hung Ran in his early period, is seen here, is, like other people in the Anhui school, is painting in a linear manner, that is a, a manner of painting reduced without any washes or texture or color or any of that, just to line, and uh, very angular. That, those are characteristics of the Anhui school, generally. Uh, I, I write about them at length, and my students do in our exhibition, uh, Shadows of Mount Huang, 1981. Anyway, and on the right, a picture of uh, old photograph of scenery of Huangshan, which was their main subject. And you see uh, the, the reason why they are doing linear and uh, angular uh, uh, painting. It, it, uh, it renders in some aspects of the uh, Huangshan scenery, but it doesn't catch the monumentality of the scenery and the greatness of the scenery and so on. Okay, anyway, that's, that's the problem that Hung Renan was facing. Now, next please, next two. In 1657, Hung Ran made a um, trip to Nanjing, 
uh, and he must have seen there some landscape paintings or copy of copies of paintings in the northern so monumental style, the kind of thing we've been looking at recently. And um, he does a uh, an album leaf, which is on the left, and he inscribes it with the date and uh, saying that he's in Nanjing and uh, so forth. And then he paints a picture uh, of a, a rocky bluff, I guess you would say. I've done a diagram of it, which is uh, on the right, showing the nature of this bluff. Now, what he has learned is how to render a, uh, a, a landscape form with great volume and um, in, in line without, without much of texturing and so on. And this is done, as you know, from what we are talking about, Yen Wen Gui and Fan Quan and so on, by rendering the t upper face of the form slanting toward us so you can read it going back, and rendering the front face and then the side face uh, also receding line by line, sort of. We've seen this in the landscapes of Yen Wen Gui and, and, um, and um, uh, Fan Quan and others. Okay, um, now Hung Ran, next please. Uh, here are the uh, the painting by Yen Mun Gui that we saw in the last lecture and a detail from just to remind you how this style was done. Now Hong Ron learns this, as I say, as you see in his album leaf and puts it to marvelously, marvelous use in a landscape of his done sometime after that. Now on the screen, next please. Um, a great painting called Coming of Autumn, uh, felt to be his masterwork now in the Honolulu Art Academy. Um, we had this in our, not only had it in our 1981 show, Shadows of Mount Huang, it was the absolute knockout of the show on the opening night. People clustered around it. The Chronicle, the, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle reviewer, Alan Temko, came and wildly went for this painting and reproduced it with his, with his very, very favorable review and so on. We could only show it for a few days, unfortunately. They would only lend it, and after that we had to replace it with a full-size reproduction. But at any rate, as I say, it was the knockout. Now, the point I always made uh, using this is that the radical thing in itself is relatively easy to do in art. Older painters of the Anhui School and contemporaries of Hung Ron were already painting even more radically reduced and geometricized landscape paintings. But their works are interesting but unimpressive generally and not much regarded today. Whereas the great masterwork of the whole school is this one, in which Hung Run combines the radically new with what you might call the supportively old, um, for an achievement that goes beyond, far beyond uh, innovation and what used to be called the shock of the new and so on. Anyway, I used to use uh, musical analogies to point out, for instance, in early 20th century music, a composer named Edgar Varese who would uh, who wrote music that was extremely dissonant and used radical techniques like quarter tones and semitones and so on, and isn't really much listened to today or much regarded. Whereas Stravinsky, combining bold new sounds with forms and techniques taken from the past, he had learned all that uh, in his early career, um, is able to produce masterworks that we still listen to and are moved by and uh, knock us over, so to speak. Okay, enough of that. I used to use the same analogy with uh, Duchamp and Picasso, but someone I don't want to, to uh, upset was upset by this, so I am leaving it out. Anyway, to go on to the rest of the lecture, having made this point, which I think is an important one, however. Okay, here we are, back with um, Yen Wen Gui and, and Fan Quan. Uh, <clears throat> I was saying before, and I'll say it again, Neo-Confucian philosophy in the northern and early southern Sung, uh, it takes uh, from Taoism the idea of an organic conception of the universe. The universe is a great organism. Uh, human morality and human ethics are interlocked with this. The Confucian sage uh, comes to be equated more or less with the Taoist true man, Jonron, whatever. Now within this order, purposeful action upsets, um, upsets the order. Human agents acting out concerns of their own on the world are upsetting. The Taoists spoke of non-action, Wu Wei. The Confucianists of, spoke of no action that was motivated by self-interest. So, and this somehow is carried over into painting. The cosmos in this conception begins as amorphous. Qi, a great 
gaseous, whatever substance, uh, changes go are carried can go through it. Changes uh, transformation. Transformation equals creation. Zaohua in the Chinese system. Creation without without any volition. There is no God behind it. Says so this is the way it's going to be, as our our uh, religion has it. The Taoists, like the Chan Buddhists, tried to break free of objectification of the outer world, uh, emphasizing inner experience and emphasizing experience of the self as a part of that world and a world as part of the self, a continuous field, so to speak, not subjective or individualistic that would come later in Chinese art, uh, certainly not the imposition of any will or feelings on nature. And of course, this uh, is followed up very much in Chan Buddhism. In the Dawa stories, craftsmen, uh, the makers of wheels and so on, uh, uh, car carvers, uh, like a butcher, uh, the craftsmen are unconscious of their actions. They transform their materials, but not purposefully. And the artist in this conception was supposed to do the same. He uses the materials around him in an artistic mode, in a proper, in a proper state of detachment. The artist recreates things that are part of his experience in terms of his understanding of it. So the order that he perceives in the world is the order that inspires his paintings. But it's not a man-made pattern. It's not uh, schemata in, the, in a sense. Nature uh, in this, in this uh, system creates without volition, and the artist has to do the same. A rock created by nature will always, more or less by definition, look natural, whereas one painted by an artist won't look natural unless he has attained this state, and it's the most difficult thing to do, really. Well, landscape painting, because, let's have go on to the next place, show these slides as I talk. Landscape painting becomes a mode of expressing this understanding and this sense of order. It becomes iconic, just as Buddhist painting is iconic in Buddhism, in that it embodies a kind of enlightenment, a state of being toward which one strives. Now, I, we can't prove that this was going on in the mind of Yen Wen Gui or Fan Quan, but it, I, I believe it's pretty clear that it underlies this great development in landscape painting. The paintings of Yen Wen Gui and Fan Quan and the others are stable, they're rocky, the, po the parts of the painting are locked firmly together. These are worlds that are universal in character, complete in themselves. Uh, you don't have any sense of wanting to go beyond them or see anything outside them. There's no suggestion, as in some 10th century paintings that I showed in an earlier lecture, suggestion of hidden spaces or pockets of space to be explored visually. Everything is presented frontally, fully visible. The composition is complete and all organized very much within the frame. And all this, as I say, uh, I think accords with Neo-Confucian cosmology and the idea of spiritual ascent, which I pointed out in these paintings, moving from the uh, worldly, the mundane, up to some spiritual level where we see temples uh, and then beyond that to pure nature. Um, the, 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 these are fitted into the composition as a kind of implicit narrative. I forgot to point out when I was talking about this in previous lectures that one can read that narrative in poetic form. For instance, in a poem titled The Temple by Bo Zhui, the great Tang poet, translated by Arthur Wei in his book the Temple and Other Poems, page 103 following. I have a copy of this I used to bring to class and read. Anyway, that uh, very nicely lays out the kind of narrative that I think is implicit in these paintings. Okay, the next please. Here, are the going back to the, um, to the um, Guo Xi painting, 1072. Guo Xi has a lot in common with these, as we saw, but he's also profoundly different in other ways. Uh, for one thing, there's a specific season in the title. Um, and um, Guo Xi's essay, Lin Chuan Gaojir, or Gaojir Ji, stresses this aspect of natural phenomena. Also, uh, that is season, seasonal change, times of day, weather conditions, all of that. And he likens these and relates them to human feelings. That's very important. One responds to the paintings somewhat according to these... Uh, changes that, uh, that correspond to human feelings. Anyway, the forms in the painting, as I pointed out, are unstable, undergo undergoing some kind of great transformation, erosion. Mists contribute a lot to this. 
and yet the painting keeps this quality of universality and permanence in a way. In this it differs from earlier painting. We saw paintings attributed to John Chen, the Ming Huang Journey, Zhao Gan, and so forth. None of them had this quality. But the fact that Guashi wrote his essay at all, and that it was transcribed and annotated by his son Guo Su, who held a position in the as a government official, means that Guashi was more self-conscious than previous major painters had been, was moving into the persona of the literate, cultivated painter. And that's a major new development in his period, as we'll see in what follows in the rest of this lecture, um, for which this is a long introduction. Okay, next please. Now, here are slides of the um, Wu family shrines from the Han Dynasty, the late Han Dynasty. I put them on only briefly. I didn't really discuss them seriously in my second lecture. But anyway, looking back at those, the Han period, uh, these, these, these works in the Han period were an art of a highly sophisticated uh, man, this high, a group of men, and done for a sophisticated audience. Men who aspired to government positions. These are pictures that drew on the past, on esoteric literature and so on. Uh, they were definitely not just the simple pictorial art of their time. So they required some cultivation in the viewer for full appreciation. And now in the Northern Song, something similar happens in painting, but more sweeping. Painting is in effect taken over by this classically educated elite who were the aspirers to official position and who made up the bureaucracy through all the levels, from the local and provincial up to the, those who were advising the emperor. It was a system that, in principle, allows men to gain position through merit, and it replaces the a system of hereditary aristocracy. David Johnson of our history department in Berkeley wrote about this in his dissertation, and Peter Ball in this wonderful book, This Culture of Ours, B-O-L, uh, Harvard, uh, write about it now. Well, when this newly risen male elite takes over painting, as they took over most of Chinese culture, actually, that is, becomes literati painting, what is first called Shi Da Fu Hua, later Wen Ren Hua, translated as literati painting. This is a term I'll use and pretty much the term everybody uses. Literati, plural, by the way. A person is not a literati, he is a literatus, which is the singular. Okay, never mind. Now, <clears throat> the next two, please. Here are two literati paintings that we'll see later as we proceed. I won't identify them now, but just put them on to look at. When I was just beginning my study of Chinese painting, Nelson Wu, my senior and teaching at Yale, was giving lectures in New York, which I attended, and he talked about primary forms versus cultivated forms. Um, primary forms being an older, simpler painting, and cultivated forms being new, uh, new uh, literati painting with certain uh, intellectual ideals behind them. This distinction is what he was talking about, the one I'm bringing out now, although he was talking about a much later period, 15th to 17th century, and the great um, scholar, artist, critic, Dung Chi Chung was his main subject. In other words, the artist is not presenting raw sensory data, but data as filtered through an organizing mind. There's an essay by Victoria Quantog, a mysterious and marvelous German scholar, whom I met and talked with at one point. Anyway, she writes about how the Confucian mode of organizing raw sensory data is somehow uh, reflected in painting. And it's a very important essay. It's in the archives of the Chinese Art Society of America, volume 6 for 1952. Uh, very much worth reading, although it's um, uh, difficult. Well, anyway, this new way of thinking about painting made the old-fashioned, simply representational kind of painting, well, it was not really simple, but it could be presented as that, made it seem unsophisticated and naive and low-class and uh, as I will point out talking about it, the people who argued this way had a rhetorical advantage over the others who really didn't have many strong spokesmen at all. Um, this whole movement anyway arises in the late Northern Song period, continues about weaker through the Southern Song, and then, the next two please, and then in the early Yuan Dynasty, this is an early work, uh, early Yuan literati, literatus painting, by Zhao Mengfu, great master of that time, dated 1296. I, I won't talk about it. And then in the early Yuan, these uh, literati painters come more prominently to the fore, and in effect 
takeover painting, more or less for the rest of its history. The opposition had no spokesman, almost by definition again. They had no access to the intellectual debate, that is, so there wasn't any. And represent, representational painting is pretty much discredited for the rest of the history of Chinese painting. This is outside our subject, really, but I wanted to get it down before proceeding. Fortunately, painting that continues the old tradition of high workmanship, refined imagery, and so on, continues in the Southern Tsung Academy and a great deal more of other uh, painting in the Southern Tsung period, the um, 12th, 13th centuries, which will be the subject of the, uh, the later lectures, which will make up the second part of the series. Uh, here are two Southern Tsung paintings. I won't identify them, but they are good examples of, um, of painting as it is preserved in Japan. As we'll see, much of the best of this painting uh, uh, Zen or Chan or Zen painting included, is preserved only in Japan. It was imported there in, from the 13th, 14th century and 12th, 13th, 14th century by monks and rulers who were not so dominated by Chinese literati tastes. And they saved it for us, thank God. In some large part, um, uh, we wouldn't have it otherwise. What we call Chan or Zen Buddhist painting would, was virtually wiped out in China. Uh, looked upon as not worth saving, and uh, heavily criticized, as I'll talk about when we come to it, uh, but was preserved, thank God, in Japan, in great examples. And great examples of many Chinese connoisseurs, I'm sorry to say, still look at it and say, ah, oh, bad brushwork, we were right in not keeping it. My good friend, much admired friend, C.C. C. Wang was that way. Anyway, where I stand on this matter myself will be clear from the speech and from my treatment of the painting of the Southern Sung in the series of lectures on this will make up part two of this series. Now, okay, last, finally, bringing back the painting by Li Gong Nian. This is a signed work from the time of transition, which I put on at the end of the previous lecture. The Emperor Hui Zhong's catalog writes of him, quote, the scenes he composes are rich in clouds and mist and have the indefinable aura of real landscape, end quote. Uh, and, as I pointed out, it's a landscape that is meant to be viewed, and in fact there is somebody in the landscape gazing at it. Uh, and what lies beyond is not a landscape you go into and explore, it's a landscape that is simply looked at. Well, all this, I think, somehow falls together. A whole set of circumstances that are new in the later 11th, early 12th century, on the one hand, and painting of the time on the other hand. I don't mean in causal terms. Uh, this this on the one hand made that, and on the other hand, happen. Something made something happen. In an earlier lecture, I used uh, Joseph Needham's distinction between Aristotelian and Chinese organic universes. The Aristotelian being cause and effect, the organic one in which things somehow move in a mysterious harmony, nothing particularly causing something else. Now, harmony one can only try to be in uh, harmony with, and so on. Okay. Anyway, um, Li Tang, the principal landscapist of the transition, whom who will be, uh, we'll look at at length in the first lecture in the next series, uh, paints, as we'll see, landscapes for contemplation, not so much like Yan Wen Gui, Fan Quan, and so on, or even Gua Xi, landscape into which, into which one is invited to enter and move around, to climb the mountains, and so on. Landscape paintings are done, that is, that are mainly to be gazed at, to be absorbed as a uh, particular view of one corner of nature. The Emperor Hui Zong's insistence on poetic content in paintings is another aspect of this. Painting portrays it as a conception in the mind, not the world outside. Okay, Southern Sung landscape, as we'll see, the best of it is will be devoted more and more to capturing uh, in paintings, capturing images that represent perceptions of landscape, as one actually perceives it, that is instead of a quasi-rational knowing of the world. In other words, uh, in philosophy, the investigation of things gives way to the school of mind and everything that follows afterwards. The first artist we take up in, uh, uh, now is an artist named Zhao Lingrong, active around 1070 to 1100. Now, we've considered before painters who were not full-time professional artists, that is, Gu Kaijer, way back, uh, who was some kind of an official beside being a painter. Uh, Wang Wei, who was a high official in the Tang Dynasty, maybe Dongyuan in the Five Dynasties, who may have been an official. 
Anyway, now we have another who's not, however, a, um, a government official, but rather a member of the Sung imperial family. Uh, he, uh, Zhao Lingrong was a fifth generation descendant of the founder of the Sung, uh, Sung Taizu. He grew up in a court environment. He was educated in the classics. He um, collected old paintings himself and calligraphy. And um, as a painter, he worked in more than one style or manner. Uh, this is something new. Hui Zheng's catalog, the Shrenhe Huapu, writes about him uh, that his paintings, quote, represent shady groves in a misty atmosphere with ducks and geese. They have an air of quiet repose, end quote. Well, it was said of Zhao Lingrong that he always painted only the scenery he could see around the capital because members of the royal family were, um, imperial family, were um, forbidden to travel far. He couldn't go off and visit the great uh, mountains of China as others could. So he painted these quiet scenes, uh, such as you might see around the capital. Actually, what he painted were rather rural or uh, uh, what, uh, anyway, uh, scenes of people living in nature. Um, and he also did landscapes in an archaistic blue and green manner. We know this from text. We don't have any safe examples known. Okay, the first picture we're going to look at is by him, uh, accepted as by him, a painting dated 1100, a hand scroll, uh, ink and colors on silk in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, river landscape with willows and cottages. This scroll was uh, owned by a, a, the artist uh, living in Taiwan, Huang Junbi, who uh, was among the sort of collector dealer beside being a painter, as so many were. I mean, any good uh, big, big painter in China is likely to, to be also a collector and somehow a dealer, like Xi Xi Wang and Zhang Da Chan and the rest of them. Huang Junbi, anyway, um, I never liked him much as a painter. He orthodox landscapist, famous for having taught Madame Zhang uh, how to paint and so on. Um, and as I say, uh, I used to I used to visit him and look at the paintings he had for sale and things he owned and so on. This scroll he apparently got by uh, not very admirable means from a woman student of his who had brought it from China, and <clears> these. <throat> He somehow got it away from her and then sold it for a big price to the Boston Museum of Fine Art. So went the story. Well, scandalous stories all, all associated with paintings, and I only report them as I heard them. At any rate, the painting is, is a wonderful painting, and <laughs> nothing, uh, it, it, having been owned by Huang Junbi, is nothing against it, for goodness sakes. Uh, former Imperial Manchu Imperial Collection, Imperial Seals all over it, and so on. Okay, I don't have a slide of the first section as such that includes the opening. I do, however, have a detail of the opening, and I'll put that at the right beside the second sections I have it and talk about them. Okay, it opens, as you see, with a slope of earth coming down. This is an old convention. We saw it in the scroll ascribed to Xu Daoning and so on. And then behind that, a group of houses, uh, thatched houses, have, this is that very uh, bucolic character that the whole painting has. The idea of living in nature away from the busy uh, noise and so on of the human world and all the contaminations of human society uh, and living uh, uh, in quiet and with, with simple people, etc. And uh, uh, several houses, uh, paths leading from two of them and joining leading off to the left. And that, of course, will continue. Uh, a fence, some kind of a drying thing leaning against one of the houses. And then the leafy trees with um, uh, birds in them. I have uh, other details later, which will show that better, so I won't speak about that, except way up the top, you see a whole cluster of little birds. You like to paint little birds, and you'll see a number of them throughout the scroll. Now, in the first section, as I have here, the path continues behind or between two willow trees. And um, then it continues over a bridge and continues on, as we'll see. And then in, in the upper left, we have the beginning of a very uh, of a, a, a motif that is associated so closely with Zhao Lingrong that you cannot see it without immediately thinking of him. I'll speak about that in a minute. 
Now the willow trees, I think I have a detail of that. Yes, here we go, uh, a willow. Uh, there's a little bird perched way up in the upper right and another down below. Um, the willows are drawn in a way that is perfectly okay for his purpose, but not the kind of uh, very beautiful willow that you would see if it were an academy master. I could show you a whole series of willow trees drawn by academy masters ending with Maoyuan, a very famous <laughs> Maoyuan painting with willows, in which they are transcendentally beautiful and um, wonderful curves and so on. Well, Zhao Lingrong doesn't do that, but what he does is perfectly okay for his purpose. I want to emphasize that what I'm doing here, what I'm talking about here, is the work of a highly cultivated aristocratic amateur. And if I say amateur, it's just not pejoratively, it's not a put down. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it's a quite a wonderful painting in its, in its way. So nothing of the technical limitations of Zhao Lingrong work against the quality of the painting, in my view anyway. Now going on. The section that follows, and here we see uh, continuing this motif, which as I say is it's very closely associated with Zhao Lingrong, a band of fog or mist um, going across a, a grove of leafy trees. Um, down below, ducks in the water, also details of that. The path leading mysteriously into the trees and taking us back there, if you imagine, moving, uh, mo moving along the path. So, uh, the paint, uh, like some other paintings we've seen, it kind of leads the viewer uh, in and out and through the various parts of the landscape. The trees are drawn, I think I have a detail, yes, here's a detail of that. The trees are drawn with different kinds of foliage uh, to distinguish the types of trees, distinguished by different brushwork, by the shapes, uh, round versus pointed at the top, and so on. Uh, the trunks of the trees down below are pretty much uniform. He doesn't try to distinguish those much or to render bark or any of that. But then the, um, the uh, fog drifting through a soft edge, quite fine. So he's able to do what he needs to for his purpose quite well. Okay, the next please. <clears throat> and here the um, fog goes off and the, and the tree, uh, tree grove disappears into a general area of mist or fog and the whole picture for a time is pretty much, the whole upper part of the picture is enveloped by fog, out of which we see flowing, quite beautifully, a uh, stream that flows, winds its way into the foreground and pours over rocks and down into the big area of water in the foreground. Now, <clears throat> we, uh, the uh, ducks in the water, uh, groups of ducks, individual ducks, and quite a few other birds more than you see at first. If you start looking carefully, you find there are a lot of birds in the picture and that they're quite uh, clearly distinguished. Here's a detail. And uh, this is uh, one of the uh, groups of uh, clusters of ducks in the water. Men, I don't know what kind of ducks. Somebody else will know that. I don't. Uh, now then, the, the next section. Now we are arriving at what uh, the sort of climax, the very quiet climax of this scroll. Uh, in which the band of fog again moves into the foreground. We see more uh, leafy trees, more of them large ones, and another group of willows in the lower right here. The path continues and it goes over, over a uh, zigzag uh, plank bridge and divides one part of it going off rightward through the trees, the other part leading into this village. Village or cluster of houses, whatever it is, it's a little unclear. I don't think he means to make it clear. It may be simply the residence of some courtly person uh, who lives out uh, in the in the uh, in the in the country, away from the city. Anyway, in the, in these simple houses. The uh, next, please. Now, I put beside it to make a, a simple but important point: a painting, an album leaf that was done some 17 years later. This is by an artist named Leon Zhong. Leon Zhong, who was an academy master working under the Emperor Huizong. I'll talk about him later. He's a famous bird and flower painter mainly. Uh, but here he is painting a landscape, and these were extremely versatile artists, these artists of the academy. They had to be, because whatever the imperial masters asked them to do, they would have to do, and they did it marvelously. You will see 
dozens or hundreds, I hope, of paintings by them as we proceed, because I'm very fond of their works. Okay, this was done, as I say, in 1117. It is in the Cleveland Museum. It was purchased of Sherman Lee, and uh, quite quite fine in itself. But you can imagine the imperial patron paint or writing a couplet or a quatrain about living uh, out in, among the trees or in the thatched houses and so on, uh, and uh, asking the uh, his court artist or one of them to paint this picture in this manner. And Zhao Ling Rong, excuse me, I'm sorry, Lian Zhong obliges with this quite lovely little leaf. Now, if it is space, convincing space that you want, or a convincing recession of the uh, of the uh, edge of the of the of the land, uh, the land banks going back, uh, this is the painting that you want. This is by far the better in that way. If you're it's convincing uh, placement of the houses among the trees, or even the trees in the lower right here are somehow more interesting, more varied than those of uh, Zhao Lingrong. On the other hand, this is a much lesser painting. Uh, and if I uh, emphasize this again, if I speak of Zhao Lingrong's as being amateurish, it's, it's in the sense of a very poetic kind of amateurism. Having made this point, let me go on. Now, here's the next. Here's the section that shows better this uh, this uh, group of houses. And this, as I say, is the uh, climax of the scroll. Really, the whole uh, height of the scroll filled with the um, uh, trees and the houses and the mist and so on. And then it recedes again, and he sort of uh, quiets down and goes off into the distance once more, with the same uh, band of mist and water flowing out of the distance, and so on. His repertory of forms is relatively small, at least in the paintings of his, we, well, this is the only one absolutely surely by him. No, wait, I'll, uh, I'll show one more. Okay. At any rate, his repertory of forms is fairly small. Uh, next, please, a detail. Yeah, here, here, closer in. He can draw the houses pretty well, well enough for his purpose. Uh, <clears throat> he does the trees, as I say, quite beautifully, and he likes these birds. He must have been a, a bird watcher, I suppose, because he, interestingly, is able to help show the different birds. <clears throat> Here are in another detail, the uh, cluster of houses and trees, all fairly flat, not really much space. Another kind of artist, a professional artist, would have made space between the trees and the houses, or between the houses themselves, or whatever. Charlie Rong doesn't attempt to do that. It's pattern, mainly flat pattern, but very moving somehow. And here, next please, a detail of the edge of the water. And you not only see the uh, cluster of ducks, another in the lower left here, mandarin ducks, I suppose they are, but also two white, larger birds in the lower right, uh, egrets of some kind, snowy egrets maybe, I'm not sure. I'm not a bird watcher exactly. But um, anyway, quite an interesting and uh, varied uh, a pr presentation of birds in the landscape, in the trees and in the water. The next, please. So here is here's the uh, uh, the mist going back again. The whole uh, what subject matter of the picture is very simple and limited, and that again is deliberate. This is not uh, like Guashi and Fan Quan and so on, a picture that tries to give you the whole world, so to speak, in the frame of the picture and invite you into it to, uh, to uh, roam around. Uh, at most, you make your way simply along the path here, and you see essentially the same things over and over again. Simple houses, mist in the trees, ducks in the water, and so on. But these are exactly the things that make up uh, Zhao Lingrong's poetic image, imagery and his uh, dream of living far from the uh, b bluster of the world and living among the simple people and so on. So here are the trees dim, the foliage fades away, dissolves, and as I say, he does this kind of thing very well. Okay, now the next place here. And here is the, uh, the end of the painting as the mist and trees disappear into a general area of fog in the upper part. And meanwhile, again, down below, some trees enter rather dramatically. This is, of course, a standard uh, technique in hand scroll painting. Things go quiet, and then suddenly other things come in dramatically. 
And here again, it's several leafy trees and uh, a rock down below. I'll have a detail in a moment. And then at the end, the artist's signature, which we'll see. Okay, N next please. Here is the detail of the trees. And again, we see birds flying. Two of them seen between the trees uh, in flight. Two of them in the upper or middle left. Uh, geese, presumably, I guess. Yeah, flying geese. And uh, there probably are little birds somewhere in the foliage. At any rate, okay, different kinds of trees sensitively painted. The whole thing is highly sensitive. Next, please. Now here, closer up, you can see the uh, the flying birds and how the tree, the tree trunks he doesn't paint with real uh, cylindricality or t uh, texture, barky texture or whatever. Uh, all that is more of the uh, professional's thing. He, does, he doesn't try to do that. Um, the next, please. And here, finally, is the um, is the uh, artist's uh, signature. And he writes the uh, era name, Yuan Fu, I guess it is, Gang Zhen, the, the uh, psychical year, corresponding, as I say, to 1100. And then he signs Dan Yan, uh, Big Year. That's his other name. Zhao Dan Yan is the other name for Zhao Lingrong. Dan Yan means great year, maybe great harvest, I suppose it means, something auspicious like that. And then B, painted it, brushed it. Um, Okay, and over it, what must be, I suppose, his own seal, something too true, something, uh, I'm not sure of that. At any rate, uh, imperial seals, old imperial important seals. So it's a highly, uh, highly important painting. Uh, his writing is larger than, any, than anything we've seen before, except maybe the Gua Xi, but mostly uh, uh, signatures have been very small. And as we'll see, the literati artists tend to write more uh, bigger and more, and often in some kind of self-promotion. We'll see that especially in Mio Run. Not that, but he's still asserting his status somehow by the, the way he writes and his calligraphy. All right then. Now uh, let's go on to look look at uh, an, uh, other Zhao Lingrong. Okay, now this little picture, next please, this in the um, Yamato Bunkakan, a private museum near Nara in Japan, this represents very well, and by on a very high level, the kind of painting that's attributed to Zhao Lingrong. And we see more or less the same things. That is, mist through the trees, um, uh, geese in the water, ducks, is it? Oh, ducks, I guess, in the water, uh, willow tr trees on the shore, a stream going back, and here uh, added is the uh, motif of uh, rooks or some kind of black dark birds anyway gathering is presumably evening darkened sky and tree and the, the birds coming in to roost okay very quiet uh, lovely evocative poetic if you will but certainly in this case done by uh, a more competent artist in the academic sense in the sure technical sense uh, not necessarily better but um, a, a different kind of artist their uh, Zhao Lingrong style was just endlessly used by painters, including all kinds of painters, amateur and professional. So, um, anyway, this, this, I say, stands very well for a great many paintings of the style. On the other hand, this one, the next please, uh, this is more likely to be from the hand of Zhao Lingrong himself. This is the painting titled River Village and Autumn Dawn uh, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. One of the several groups of paintings that uh, Wen Feng, their curator for many years, Asian art curator, uh, bought from Xi Zi Wang, Wang Ji Chen. Wang Ji Chen had a terrific eye for mm, style in this sense, artist's hand, that kind of thing. And he, uh, I don't say he never went wrong, but he didn't go wrong all that much for this kind of painting. Okay, and this is the first half of the hand scroll. And uh, again, uh, a um, we see a, a bridge going across a marshy uh, stream and uh, leading into the uh, interior of the painting. We see a grove of trees, rather more varied in this case, rather more or better in quotation marks, uh, representation of depth and, it's, uh, and different kinds of trees and more color. So maybe it's a slightly more interesting and more varied work than the 
Boston Museum scroll. But um, anyway, they, they could quite, quite likely both be genuine works of Zhao Lingrong. I have no reason to say otherwise. Now here in the second half of the scroll, something really quite interesting and evocative and poetic and all of that. I think it's quite a lovely scroll. Uh, light colors on silk. A, um, the, here it's definitely a, the dwelling of some recluse, probably, living in nature, living far away from, uh, per, from uh, the cities, retired maybe from official service. That sort of lies behind images of this kind. And uh, here are the, uh, the uh, edges of the water and the water and so on. It's done not so terribly convincingly, perhaps, as another kind of artist would do it, but quite poetically and interestingly. And the hand of the artist is interesting here. Down in the um, lower left here, not the oh, middle left, let's say, we see a, uh, a, a fishing platform. Uh, so the uh, scholar recluse who was in the house behind, probably still asleep as River Dawn, uh, lives in harmony with rural people or fishermen and so on, which is another uh, standard, uh, of, standard feature of paintings of this kind. Well, okay, um, something, uh, he also, as I say, did pictures in the blue and green style, but to my knowledge, none of these survives. But just to, to know that he did it suggests that we see something very new and very modern here, centuries earlier than it would happen in European painting. That is, an artist who's able to choose a style consciously, who can do painting in one style one day and in another uh, the next day. Not, that is, the slow and natural movement from one style to another that happens in the traditional mm, development, in quotation marks, of a landscape that we've been following, the kind of Gombrichian development. Antiquarianism uh, is a prominent feature in Northern Song culture that is collecting old bronzes, compiling uh, books of old inscriptions and so on. And the style consciousness that goes with antiquarianism and collecting. Now, now it comes to affect the production of paintings in which the choices of styles becomes an important element. Styles intellectually chosen or chosen by someone who is also a um, connoisseur. Connoisseurship, that is, is feeding into art history. Okay, we go on to the next artist now, who is a, another uh, nobleman artist named Wang Shun, active in the late late uh, 11th century, act around 1085, anyway. He was a nobleman artist not by birth, but by marriage. He married the daughter of the Emperor Yingzong, and he lived for a time within the imperial palace. He also served as a high official. He was an important collector. Uh, artists we'll see later, Su Shi, Mi Fu, Li Gunglin, all knew him and praised him and so forth. They wrote about each other quite a lot. So a lot of writing about this kind of painting. Suddenly we have a huge literature. I translated some of it. Susan Bush has translated a lot of it. Other people have. Okay. About the landscape painting of Guang Shun, a 12th century writer named Deng Chun writes this, quote, he followed Li Chung's method, but he also used the gold and green coloring, end quote. Gold and green is more or less the same as what I'm calling blue and green. They sometimes use gold, but anyway, that is the archaistic uh, colorful style, line and color style. <clears throat> so, like Zhao Lingrong, that is, Wang Shun used different styles at different times, not like the traditional artist who inherits a style that, so to speak, belongs to his local tradition. And he learns that, and then perhaps he changes it if you follow Gombrich's arguments about how an artist uh, looks at nature and alters his style to bring it closer to uh, observed reality and so on, and passes on the style somewhat changed to his followers, but in a slow, natural, uh, gradual process. Anyway, here is a painting then, uh, 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 ascribed to him very, no, it's a, quite, I think, quite likely by Wang Shun. The writing in the upper right here appears to be uh, I don't know, maybe in this time, maybe it's the Emperor Huizong's writing. Anyway, uh, maybe some imperial script and uh, to be taken very seriously. This is not the whole scroll. There's still more at the left, but I unfortunately don't have a slide of that. I can only show a detail from it. This is the painting titled Light Snow Over a Fishing Village. 
Um, Richard Barnhart, who is very fond of this artist and has written very well about him and done good studies of Wang, uh, Wang Shan. Barnhart notes in this the presence of the hooded scholar. Uh, let's go on for a moment and have the next, uh, which is a detail. We can go back to the other one. Um, here we see the uh, hooded scholar and his servant carrying, it may be a chin, a musical instrument, over his shoulder. Uh, the, the scholar leaning slightly with a hood and uh, a cane, or uh, yeah, a walking stick anyway. Um, Dick Bernhardt writes uh, uh, about this, quote, this is something akin to the romantic landscape of 19th century Europe, a vision of landscape clearly and frankly seen through the eyes of an individual who shapes it into his own image, end quote. This is a good observation and consistent with the point of view that I'm taking about how landscape becomes more, more subjective and so on. Well, the, the style, let's go back. The style is, as you see, the style of Li Chang and Guo Xi, uh, but suited to the special, somewhat more limited uh, technical uh, abilities of the amateur artist, which is quite all right. Spatially quite convincing, well done. Uh, the masses rise up effectively, trees on them. Um, uh, this, on the one hand, this style had become a local tradition, especially in northeast China, uh, Shandong province, and so on. But on the other hand, it was something that was available and could be taken up by any artist who chose to do that, if you uh, the, are the kind of artist who chooses a style. Um, okay, now we go on to, let's see, here's a detail from the uh, further section of the scroll at the end, old tree leaning over the water and partly dipping into the water. Uh, expressive, certainly expressive, more, more than descriptive maybe, because it, isn't, it doesn't grow exactly as a tree grows. It wanders a bit too much back and forth, and it's a little too, a little too squiggly. Moss hanging down from it, uh, lots of little twigs, uh, but powerfully expressive. Uh, snow, uh, blue and white uh, to, uh, pigment added here and there on, the, on top of the branches and so on as, uh, as falling snow. Now we go on to the next, uh, next section, please. Um, okay, uh, now we come to the, when we look at it, into the um, opening section again, we see the passage where he represents fishermen and the title of it, I say, is Light Snow Over a Fishing Village. So um, there are a number of fishermen here in boats and doing various things. Now, but when we go in closer, here's the a detail of the right section. Well, here are fishermen in boats with, with uh, uh, matted uh, pr protection or uh, uh, places for, uh, under, uh, under which they live. And uh, he's, he's got this pretty well, and a willow tree and so on. But then on the other side, when you look closer in at these, you see that really he's what can be harsh and say faking it. Uh, the fisherman in the now in the middle right uh, who is raising his net. His net raising apparatus is, is crazy. It, it, he doesn't really understand it at all. I'm not going to bring back Zhao Gan's painting and show how they really looked, but this isn't it, believe me. He's got two of the fulcrum that he's supposed to raise it by. There are two of them, really, and one of them is is based across the stream. I don't, I don't know what, he's, what the painter really is up to. Anyway, the painter isn't really trying to get it right. And the poor guy is pulling on the rope and the whole thing is not, not really going to work if he tries to do it that way. Okay, um, but th this was not, um, not a, um, a painter who was trying to report really on the, um, on, on the lives of fishermen. Um, on the contrary, he's too rich and, and aristocratic and busy to spend time among the fishermen in the way Zhao Gan and others did, or to master the skills for depicting their lives. That isn't really the point. So we, we can't take this too seriously in that way as a, as a representation of fishermen. Well, let's go on anyway. Now the next, um, the next uh, painting of Wang Shan, the other one extant, uh, again a very fine and generally accepted painting, is this one. Here's the whole thing. And um, this is titled Serried Hills Over a Misty River. It's in the Shanghai Museum this time. This too is a favorite of Dick Bernhardt, who writes quite movingly about it 
He calls it, quote, perhaps the perfect embodiment of this new landscape of exile. Well, it happens that Wang Shun was in political disfavor of the, at this time in his exile. And Dick calls it, quote, islands of blue and green shimmering like a mirage. That's good, because that's what we have here. And again, it's a, well, it's a landscape in the blue and green style, first of all, which is uh, radically different from the Li Guo, Li Chung Guo Xi style, the other one. And again, a painting which, um, which uh, offers no special display of skill. Uh, let's go in and look at the, uh, as you see, it, it just begins just with an, uh, an expanse of silk. And then gradually, a few hills, and then gradually, gradually, we see this, uh, this um, well, mountain, hill, whatever you'd call it, and groups of trees and mist in the middle distance. It's all uh, quite a ways from us, and that goes with its, what Dick would call his poetic intent. That's, that's, I say, a good analysis of it. Okay, here we are up closer with the, uh, or with the original side of it. Um, <clears throat> Again, we're, we're dealing with a, a, a version of the style that's been adjusted to the special abilities of the uh, cultivated amateur, um, amateur artist. Uh, the trees are flattened, the tree grows are flattened, and there's no intention of, uh, of uh, space uh, within a tree grove, or, and the clouds, as you see, are archaistic clouds in the, uh, uh, the blue-green manner. Getting closer up, you can see, you begin to see the drawing. Um, it's definitely outline and color, rather flat color mostly. Uh, blue and green shading into each other. The trees are drawn in flat forms and colored. Uh, pinkish, uh, black, dark, uh, green, and so on. The next please. Now I put beside it, for comparison, just to bring it back, a detail from the Emperor Minghuang's Journey to Shu, which is, uh, as you remember, a painting associated with Li Shishun, the son of Li Zhaodao, and uh, is um, probably a copy after a Tang Dynasty work, maybe 7th century, anyway. But here you see the line and color method in its early, in its early form. Also the, um, uh, the outline clouds drifting around flat clouds, Everything very much uh, flat outline forms. And um, uh, that this is what Wang Shan is somehow referring to. I put also here now again beside it a very different kind of detail from a blue and green painting. What, what an up-to-date artist, a little bit later, but not much, um, might do with a blue and green style just to show what is possible. This is from a hand scroll I'll talk about in a later lecture probably by an artist named Zhao Bo Zhu, who's a 12th century academy master who specialized in blue and green archaistic landscape. And here, the, uh, style, the blue and green color is used on powerfully volumetric, surging, massive landscape forms, uh, such as had been developed by that time. We'll talk about an artist named Li Tang, who somehow lies behind this kind of landscape. Anyway, powerful but very different here volume and mass and space and all the and scale look at the little houses down the right all the rest of it very different now back to Wang Shan just to finish with this painting uh, closure up now he, he has picked up such things as the uh, the kind of stepped outlining of the forms you see here in the upper left that comes from well Fan Quan and his followers and so on and it just based on eventually on actual geological uh, phenomena. But um, it, he, uh, this too is sort of an element of style and it's not naturalistic. And the clouds, I say, flow through the forms and silhouette the trees and um, anyway. Okay, next please. Here, even closer, you see the hand of the artist. Uh, sensitive, uh, capable, of perfectly, he has enough technique for, for his needs because for the kind of painting he's doing. But he doesn't have the uh, professional technical skills that might, if you want to do, lead to uh, real volumetric painting with uh, believable uh, surfaces and so on. He um, has a little bit of texturing, as, as if texturing on the edges of this form, but not much, not like Fan Quan Gua Xi, obviously. 
And here a, a detail finally showing the lower part and the waterfall coming down, quite lovely. And a pa pathway, uh, wooden planks of some kind, and um, flat clouds and lovely trees. A lovely painting anyway, okay. Now we go on. The idea of archaism, um, which this lies behind this painting certainly, interrupts what has up to now been pretty much a traditional development of landscape painting. That is, collecting an appreciation of old paintings uh, seemed to demand an appreciation of style, not just seeing the picture, uh, the painting as a picture for a pictorial value. Now, later painting like uh, uh, Fan Quan Gua Xi and so forth had largely escaped that limitation as the artist must have seen it, uh, limitation of having to read style and so on, the hand of the artist, through these great feats of formal unification and somehow almost submerging the hand of the artist into the uh, materials of the painting, making the painting that is more immediately believable and acceptable as a picture. Well, this comes up to Fan Quan and Gua Xi, and then it's pretty much over, I'm afraid. Our Gombrichian development, that is. But against that now, we have the rise of aristocrat amateur painters, scholar amateur painters, emphasizing style, brushwork, facture, that is the making of the picture, French word, uh, and all of this rather than image, with the resulting loss of power of the painting as imagery, back to a more intellectual reading of the painting, such as connoisseurship demanded. All right then, here we go, and uh, we'll see this in extreme forms in some, uh, some of the paintings we're going to see. But before that, let me do a read a passage from a writer named Ouyang Xu, Ouyang Shu dated 10, 1007 to 1072. In my old dissertation back in 1958, I translated this, discovered it in browsing through Northern Song writings, and as I did a lot of things, and translated this. Um, he was a great scholar statesman, one of the people who opposed the Prime Minister Wang An Shur, so he was close to the group of artists we're going to talk about, uh, Su Shur, Mi Fu, and others. And um, Ouyang Shu writes this, quote, <clears throat> Loneliness and desolation, tranquility and leisureliness, these are the conceptions hard to paint. Even if the painter captures them, the person seeing the, his painting won't necessarily discern them. Flying and running, slow and fast, these are matters of shallow conception, easy to see. But quiet and peace, awesome stillness, feelings of a remote flavor, it is more difficult to give form to these. As for high and low, front and back, near and far, horizontal and vertical layers, that is, planes of height and depth in the painting, these belong to the artifices of the professional painter and are nothing that concerns connoisseurship." End quote. Well, so much for the great achievements of the Northern Song monumental landscape, Fan Quan Gua Xi, Yan Wen Gui, all the rest of it. Dismissed here is not really worthy of attention. Well, 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 well. Okay, here we go.